Uh, but I do want to talk a little bit about the, the birth of the Signal Corps because it's one of those uh, things that comes out, those developments that comes out of the Civil War that it, it's, it's not the, the, the infantry, it's not artillery, it's not cavalry, it's not the guys that are fighting, but nevertheless, it is very important to what goes on. And I tend to find myself attracted to the, the people and the parts of the armies that sort of exist maybe on the fringes or in the background, like medical corps, signal corps, transportation, all those things that uh, armies need, but don't get as much attention because they're not the ones that are, are firing the guns. So uh, that gives a little bit of what I hope to talk about, what I hope to achieve tonight. Uh, let's go to the next slide, please. Thank you. So uh, the first thing I want to do, how many people have been to Seminary Ridge Museum? All right, a couple. I can't see online, of course. Um, but the Seminary Ridge Museum and Education Center is located in the oldest building on the campus of the Lutheran Seminary on the western edge of Gettysburg. And this is an image from 1833. It's the first pictorial depiction of the seminary campus. And it was actually completed likely before the seminary was finished. So there you see the three buildings there, all three buildings exist today. But at the time that this image was prepared, the building on the right to the north of the main seminary building wasn't built yet. So it was an image that was supposed to be what the campus was going to look like rather than what the campus looked like at the time. And I put a quote there at the bottom. It continues on the next slide in a moment, but uh, it's from Henry Eister Jacobs, whose father was Michael Jacobs. Uh, if you're familiar with Gettysburg, Michael Jacobs was a Gettysburg College professor who kept the weather for all three days of the battle. Indeed, he did it for 20, 20 odd years. Uh, but Henry Eister Jacobs witnessed the Battle of Gettysburg he comes back to the seminary in 1914 and gives a speech in which he says that this old building is more truly a monument of the great battle than are the hundreds of costly structures scattered over this historic field, of course, referencing battle monuments. They were not here when the air was full of shrieking shells and stifling vapors. Next slide. But it was then that these walls received their baptism of fire, this building was itself a part of the battle. And this is of course the, the famous July 15th-ish photograph taken by Matthew Brady, uh, the very first photograph ever made of the seminary. Uh, so what really sets Seminary Ridge Museum apart from other museums that you see elsewhere about the Civil War, bless you, is that we are in a building that was a part of the battle. And that's going to factor into what I'm uh, talking about tonight. Many times you go to museums like the Gettysburg Visitor Center or the National Civil War Museum in Harrisburg, both really great museums, both in buildings that were built in the last 20 years. So here we have we are a little bit different. Uh, next slide, please. And today, this old building in this old building, little known stories of the Civil War take center stage like the Signal Corps. And we're going to start uh, by talking about this man, uh, Albert Meyer, Dr. Albert Meyer, uh, MD. And he is the father of the United States Signal Corps. You can't tell the story of the Signal Corps without uh, telling the story of Albert Meyer, who's born in 1827 or 1828 in Newburgh, New York, not all too far from here, kind of far, but closer than if I was coming from Pennsylvania. Uh, he goes to uh, college in uh, Geneva, New York, uh, Hobart, what's now Hobart and, and Smith Colleges, uh, and then goes to medical school in Buffalo. And at, his, at the time that he goes to medical school, uh, he also becomes a telegraph operator. So he has this sort of unique combination of medical training and communications training, uh, which is going to come into play as he is graduating from medical school. 
Uh, his thesis in medical school was a sign language for deaf mutes. And what he does is he creates a system of communication for people that have uh, auditory disability by tapping on the hand or on the cheek. And it becomes a way of communicating. And that is how he, uh, one of the ways in which he graduates from medical school is coming up with this new, uh, this new method. And uh, oops, back one, one sec. Um, he joins the army later on in 1854 as a, an assistant surgeon. Uh, we have to remember, of course, at this time that the armies were much smaller than we see during the Civil War. Uh, the United States Army as a whole in 1860 consists of about 16,000 men. Uh, and many of them are scattered throughout the West, the, the new burgeoning West, um, fighting Native Americans scattered at, at these uh, kind of distant forts. Uh, so he ends up in Texas. And I have to assume that you have this man who's young, he's very intelligent, obviously, and he's probably pretty bored being at a Western outpost <laughs> army fort. Uh, so what does he do? He starts to kind of build upon his training and start to develop a new system of communication that can be used long distances. And he comes up with what we know as uh, a wigwag signaling system. Uh, wigwag using one flag and wigging and wagging it essentially uh, to communicate. It's different from semaphore, which uses usually two flags. So that's uh, a distinction I just want to draw early on. Um, so Meyer is coming up with this system and we're not really sure how he comes up with the idea. We know that he has the skills, certainly between his training and his experience. One of the histories of the United States Signal Corps, in fact, the history of the United States Signal Corps, which was published in the 1870s, says that he saw Comanche Indians signaling to each other on a, on a hill, from hill to hill, uh, and that is what spurred him on to create this new system. Uh, he wants to share his system, of course. He certainly wants to have some credibility, some attention. Uh, and he sends a letter uh, to the then Secretary of War. This is about 1856, the Secretary of War providing uh, an example of his his system. It's not fully fleshed out, but he basically says, I have an idea of ways to communicate. Uh, anybody know who the Secretary of War, and if any, if any room is going to know, it's going to be this one. Jefferson Davis is the Secretary of War. Well, Davis isn't really impressed at this point. It's sort of not a fully formed plan. It's kind of vague, and, and Davis says, you know, I, I'm not really, we're not really interested right now. Um, but it also goes through the chief of engineers, uh, Joseph Totten. And Totten is a little bit more impressed by what he sees out of this young doctor. And it sort of stays on his uh, radar. So administration change, okay, 1857, new secretary of war, anybody? John Floyd. I didn't expect anybody to know that. But again, if a room is going to know who the Secretary of War in 1857 is under Buchanan. Um, and, uh, and basically, he, he gets another chance. Um, he's probably by this time kind of fleshed the ideas out a little bit more. He's on the radar of an influential person. And, uh, and it comes up again in front of the War Department. And this time, he, he gets an, an in. And there's going to be a commission uh, that is put together, uh, a board that's going to uh, be put together to assess the effectiveness of this new system. And who is this board overseen by? An engineer in the old army? Robert E. Lee. Exactly. 
Um, and Robert E. Lee is not that impressed either, but he is uh, more forgiving, I guess, than Jefferson Davis. Lee says, quote, it is useful as an accessory, but not as a substitute. So it's a cool thing, you know, we can maybe communicate, but it's not going to replace people running or, or handing off dispatches to by horseback. It's, it's never, it's not going to replace that, but Lee lets it, lets it pass and it, and it goes into a, a more rigorous testing phase uh, in 1859. And Meyer and his uh, protege, his assistant at the time, a man named E. Porter Alexander, who some of you might recognize from Gettysburg fame, he's Longstreet's chief of artillery, begin to test and hone this system. Uh, Fortress Monroe in Virginia, New York Harbor, West Point, and uh, Washington DC eventually. So they, they spend about a few months or so trying to get this system sort of where it can go before um, Congress and get, and get approved. So he's moving along from 1854, joining the army to now we're in about 1859. Even though he's experienced some setbacks here, he has moved his system along, but it is really going to take off you know, probably the best thing that happened for Meyer's system is the outbreak of the Civil War, because now he has something that really can be used. And part of the reason that it's become, gonna, going to become so important is because the size of the armies is just going to explode. Okay, 16,000 men in the United States Army when Albert Meyer joins in 1854. By the time of the Battle of Gettysburg, which is less than a decade later, can you believe that? It's only nine years later. The Army of the Potomac, which is just one of the armies within the United States Army, is going to number 90,000. All right, I can't do math, but that's a big number, big increase. <laughs> um, so that's one of the reasons that this is really going to take off, is because you have armies that are growing exponentially. And we need to be able to communicate amongst the armies, different armies, but also different parts of the army. And we'll see how that plays out within the battle of Gettysburg and the Gettysburg campaign. So Meyer, after he tests his system, it's approved by Congress in 1860, where Meyer becomes what's known as the chief signal officer. What Congress does not want to do quite yet is establish a separate branch of the signal corps. Okay, they see value in this system, they see value in mine, but they also have a lot of other stuff going on that's not chief signal officer. So Meyer becomes the chief signal officer. What he can do is start to pull men from different commands and train them in his code and train them to use the flags and the tools, the equipment, which we'll talk about in a few minutes. But any of these men could be called back to their respective commands. So you might invest a lot of time in learning this system. Meyer is going to invest a lot of time in teaching you this system, and then you might get pulled away. Okay, so at this point, there's no separate group that is just of signal officers. Uh, that's going to become uh, come later. Let's go to the next slide and let's talk a little bit about uh, training and about the equipment that was used. So the key here with the United States Signal Corps <clears throat> is that it's a it's a quick and movable system. We don't have to lay telegraph wire, although there is something called the flying telegraph, which can be set up very quickly. But the idea is that all of the tools that you would need to communicate via signal flags could be carried by one or two men. You're not going to need this huge infrastructure to communicate. You can have man here and man five miles away. Uh, as long as they can see each other and they can read the signals, they can communicate. Uh, so that's really the, the, the key here. 
And figure one up at the top is what this, all of this would look like when packed up. Okay, so it's, it's pretty, pretty small and simple. Um, the, you would have uh, different types of flags. The largest one, I believe, is six by six. Give you an eye. Um, and uh, six by six, four by four, and two by two. Okay, you want these nice, really, really big so they can be seen. You have uh, different lengths of staff that could be put together to make it uh, up to a <coughs> feet high. Um, I think it's four, yeah, four foot sections, so 16 feet high. Um, and then what's the big problem about this system? When could you not use it? Right. 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 <laughs> well, it, it gets difficult in wind, and we'll talk, I'll talk about that my experience at the end, but really at night. Um, so you do have different uh, components that can be used as a, uh, as a torch uh, and fuel, so you can use this, uh, you, can, you can communicate at night. The other thing I want to point out is you'll notice, of course, that the flags have these red squares in them. This might be apocryphal, but it makes sense. Why is the, why is the red square there? Who wants to be waving around a white flag in the middle of that? You start sending the wrong message. Uh, the other part uh, about the different colors of the flag is being able to use them against different backgrounds. So if you are against sort of a, a, a sky, or something bright, you're probably going to use the darker flags, but if there's ground or mountains in the background, you have uh, a white flag, so it's easier to see. And these soldiers, these signal corpsmen, corpsmen would be using very powerful telescopes and very powerful binoculars as well to be able to see, you know, in some cases, 10 or 15 miles. So you're up high, powerful telescope, what else is that doing? Watching the enemy. The signal core is going to also take on a, another role as we get into the Civil War. And uh, that's a role of observation. So to be up really high, why wouldn't we be using them as, uh, as observers as well? So we get to the to the early part of the Civil War, 1860, 1861, Albert Meyer is going to establish a camp of instruction uh, in the Georgetown neighborhood of Washington, D.C., uh, Red Hill. And this is actually, uh, it's captioned a group at Signal Camp, Georgetown, D.C., 1861. And you can see in the image the flag and its relative size to soldiers. So he begins to train men in his new system. So let's talk a little bit about the system. Let's advance the slide. All right. There are different types of codes that Meyer goes to during the Civil War, but essentially movements of the flag to the left, right, to the right, to the left, are going to correspond with different numbers. And those numbers correspond to letters. So, uh, you know, one, one, which I'm, I'm pretty sure is movement to the right, uh, is an A. Um, one, four, two, three is, is B, and so on and so forth. And number five is straight down in front of you, uh, end of a word, end of a sentence, end of a message. Uh, so it, it, it does take some time to learn. Uh, but I liken it to people who can learn music, uh, which I can't do. Uh, people are learning Morse code at the time, which I can't do. Um, so it doesn't appeal to me to learn this, although I have done it with students. But it certainly is something that, that people are, uh, are learning. Uh, let's go to the next slide, because uh, one of the concerns, of course, there we go. Uh, one of the concerns, of course, is what happens when, if the enemy gets a hold of the code 
And uh, of course, AJM, Albert J. Meyer, thinks of that uh, and creates a cipher disk. Uh, this is all part of, I could come back and talk about the codes and ciphers during the Civil War. Um, but basically, I mean, you can see it. this is one at the National Civil War Museum in uh, Harrisburg uh, in the curator's hand. Um, and it's sort of like something you see out of a cereal box where you turn the inside uh, disc and it, it lines up with different outsides. So you can set mm -hmm. different codes as long as everybody knows what the code is, you can change it daily. Um, and you can see here that it's a different type of code. We have eights and ones, uh, which is a later code that Meyer comes up with. Uh, they are using this. They, they, they are using this and it, it shows up um, at the Battle of Chancellorsville. Uh, they're using signals and they're using ciphers during the Battle of Chancellorsville and there is a concern that the cipher is broken. John, uh, uh, John Sedgwick, commanding the Sixth Corps, and Daniel Butterfield, who's uh, chief of staff to, to uh, General Hooker, um, kind of had this back and forth because uh, Butterfield thinks that the Confederates have broken the cipher and sends a um, sends a message to Sedgwick that says. Uh, says don't use your flag, don't use your signals, the enemy can read them. Um, and it turns out that in the end, they didn't know that they, the Confederates, from what we understand, never broke any Union cipher, um, but it undermines for a little bit the confidence in the cipher, in this system. Uh, how do we use this if it's possible that uh, the Confederates are uh, breaking them? So let's go to the next slide. Um, this is really cool. And I use this when I do, uh, do educational programs with students, which I'll talk about uh, towards the end. But you see here, this is just, this is a page from, from uh, one of the histories. And instead of signaling out an entire word, which could be time consuming, uh, they had abbreviations. And the ones that I've circled that are squared off here, the letter R stands for R, uh, A-R-E. Your is U R. U is Y-O-U. So it really, it's an it's, it's early form of texting, uh, which is, is a way to, when I do this program with, with students, the way to connect with them. One of the reasons that I got so into this is because this, when I took over as education coordinator at the museum in 2014, uh, this was the first program that I came up with. So it's been something that I have lived with uh, for almost eight years now. So, uh, and, and this is one of the things that I saw that really um, clicked with me. Um, and, and being able to use this with students. So let's advance. So let's talk about Gettysburg. Uh, that's why we're all here, right? So March of 1863, March 3rd, 1863. So three months before Pickett's start, Albert Meyer finally gets his wish. He is going to have a separate signal court. Finally makes it through Congress, House of Representatives, Senate, gets onto Lincoln's desk, Lincoln signs that there is going to be a separate branch of the army called the Signal Corps. Uh, so he's gonna get his men and he's going to uh, be able to keep them. They're not gonna go away. Uh, this man becomes very important in the Battle of Gettysburg. First Lieutenant Aaron Jerome. Uh, Aaron Jerome was born in Alabama, uh, but somehow uh, thinks, think we think that he, he's, he's orphaned and is taken in by family. Uh, in Orange, New Jersey. So he ends up here in New Jersey, and when the Civil War breaks out, he joins the, fourth, the first New Jersey. Uh, then is brought over into uh, Myers' training, 
uh, and then becomes part of the United States Signal Corps as a first lieutenant, Aaron Jerome. And this is him on a signal station, a makeshift signal station at Elk Mountain during the Sharpsburg campaign, or the Antietam campaign, I remember, New Jersey, I'm above the Mason Dixon line. Uh, and you can see here, right, that this is sort of a, 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 a blown in picture, zoomed in picture, but the actual picture, the full image, it's a, it's a real high stack of, uh, of logs that you can see there. So you'd be on top of the mountain, but then you would even build a structure on top of the mountain to get you up high enough. So during the March North, at Gettysburg, in the Gettysburg campaign, and I'll call it the Gettysburg campaign, yet they don't know where they're gonna end up, but they're moving North uh, in June of 1863. Throughout the march, signal stations are being established so the different corps of the army can communicate with each other. And then on June 20th, the uh, two signal officers are going to be assigned to each corps. So each corps is going to have them traveling with them. It's going to become important when we get to, uh, to Gettysburg. But on June 30th, we see a signal station that's established between Army headquarters in Pawneetown, Maryland, and Emmitsburg. But we also see one of the drawbacks to the system. I'm going to read part of the official record by uh, Lemuel Norton, who is the chief signal officer with the Army of the Potomac. On June 30th, a signal station was in place in the church steeple at Pawneetown, and a party was sent to Emmitsburg for the purpose of opening a line between General J.F. Reynolds and headquarters. Communication was not open this day on the account of the haziness of the atmosphere. Uh, the officers attached to the first court from a station of observation on the mountain back of Emmitsburg made telescopic reconnaissance towards the Emmitsburg. So we see some of the drawbacks here with the signal court in practice. Uh, one of which is you still have to send somebody, at least one person, here they send a party, to the other unit of the army that say, hey, start a, start a signal station, which takes time. Uh, you see the haziness of the atmosphere is precluding, is stopping the, uh, the, the communication. But you see, they make the best out of it anyway. They're going to use their high prominent point to make observation. I know exactly where they're talking about. This mountain is um, behind Mount St. Mary's College right now. And Indian Lookout. Yeah, and you can see all very far. So uh, they make the best out of it. So Aaron Jerome is going to uh, be with Buford, attached to Buford's cavalry division. Uh, and Buford is going to ride up into Gettysburg, as we probably know, on the uh, on the afternoon of June 30th, uh, and he is going to ride in from the south. He had communicated, conversed with Reynolds in Emmitsburg, Maryland, and then ridden up the Emmitsburg Road to towards Gettysburg. Now, as he gets just out of town, Buford is going to look out to the northwest towards the seminary, and he's going to see. Johnston Pettigrew's brigade, which has come down the Chambersburg Pike into the suburbs of Gettysburg, and that's Pettigrew's line, not mine. Uh, and Pettigrew is going to see Buford, and, and Pettigrew is going to pull back towards Cashtown on the Chambersburg Pike. With his orders not to bring about a general engagement, Pettigrew says, I'm not bringing about a general engagement. Uh, but this confirms for Buford that there is a body of Confederate troops out in the mountains west of Gettysburg. So Buford rides up. Uh, he's going to first establish his headquarters at the Eagle Hotel in downtown Gettysburg, now site of 7-Eleven. And he's going to send his two brigades, William Gamble and Tom Devin, to cover the western and northern approaches to town. Uh, and eventually, Buford is going to ride out to Seminary Ridge himself. And he's going to say to Aaron Jerome, and this is, this is Jerome writing after the battle. He, Buford, ordered me, then first lieutenant and signal officer of his division, to seek out the most prominent points and watch everything. 
to be careful to look out for campfires and in the mornings, morning dust. Well, what's the most prominent point on the western side of town? Cemetery. So much of what we know about Buford's movements and the cupola and the Buford, Buford's association with the cupola of, Schmuck, of, of seminary building, Schmucker Hall, uh, comes from Aaron Jerome himself. After the battle, after the war, Aaron Jerome writes two writings. One is, uh, well, actually, they're both letters to Winfield Scott Hancock. And what Jerome try, is trying to do is make sure that Buford gets credit for his role in the battle of Gettysburg. Of course, Buford's dead before the year is out. He dies in December of 1863 of typhoid, probably suffering from it when he's at Gettysburg. And Jerome wants to make sure that everybody knows the importance of the role that Buford played. So he writes these letters and he does a really good job showing Buford's importance. But also this is where we get a lot of information about his movements and about what's going on in, at the seminary and in the cupola. Uh, that day. So Jerome goes up there, gets starts to get dark. He starts to see those campfires, hundreds of campfires burning in the mountains. And we know that because there are civilians that end up in the cupola as well to talk about these campfires. The next morning, five o'clock in the morning, Harry Heath Division commander in AP Hill's Third Corps is going to begin marching down the Chambersburg Pike, touch off the Battle of Gettysburg. At that point, Jerome is likely going to see the cloud of dust that Hill's men are, or, uh, Heath's men are picking up as they march towards uh, Gettysburg. Now, Buford knows he can't stop a Confederate onslaught, but what he can do is he can slow them down long enough, hopefully, for Reynolds to come up. And Reynolds and Buford had been in communication as Buford comes up to Gettysburg, and then also Buford is sending communications back to Reynolds and to me the night before the battle. So everybody is really well appraised of what's going on on the, on the Union side by probably about midnight, the 30th into the 1st. So as, as Buford is coming up to the cupola, and he's up there at least twice on the morning of July 1st, he is probably looking as much to the south, to the direction of Emmitsburg, where Reynolds is coming from. He's probably looking that way more than he's looking towards where the Confederates are coming from. He knows the Confederates are there, but he needs to know <laughs> when Reynolds is coming up. And... Uh, Everybody's seen the movie, right? Yeah, we've all seen it. Um, actually, the scene in the movie of, of Buford and uh, and Reynolds, what Bill is John, all of that comes from Aaron Jerome's writings. That's the only place it comes from. Um, so uh, this is Jerome again. And looking about the country, I saw the core flag of General Reynolds. I was still in the seminary cupola, uh, but being the only signal officer with the cavalry, I had nobody to communicate with. So Jerome sends somebody down to find Buford. Buford comes up, my oh, God, it's in the movie. Uh, and what goes John Devils to pay? Can you hold, I reckon, all of that, yeah. Uh, so of course, Reynolds rides off to his demise. Uh, the battle continues. And uh, as the day goes on, Aaron Jerome writes about being able to see uh, uh, Oliver Howard's Corps come up from the south. They also notice that there is a looming threat from the north uh, in uh, Robert Rhodes, coming, which is coming down from uh, the Harrisburg area, and Jubal Early's division, which is coming down the Harrisburg Road. Um, this is Jerome again. One of my men came down to me, so he might be out of there by that point. Uh, Jerome, with a message saying that they saw another infantry corps and thought it might be Howard's 11th Corps. Buford then ordered me to ride as fast as my horse could carry me and asked Howard to come up on the double quick, because by this point they know that there are men that are coming from uh, the north. 
So again, we see sort of a struggle with the signal core here is that if you don't have anybody to communicate with, it ain't gonna work. So he has to go down, get on his horse, ride and find, and find power. Um, and eventually, as the day progresses, the Confederate line uh, overwhelms Union forces west and north of town. Uh, the line breaks seminary, the town, Gettysburg College, all fall into uh, Confederate hands. Let's go to the next slide. Uh, this shows the position of uh, some of the signal stations. On July 1st, you have the seminary in the blue circle. Pennsylvania College was briefly used as just an observation post. Uh, that's with the yellow circle. And Oliver Howard eventually establishes a signal station on Cemetery Hill, which you can see there are two crossed flags there. Uh, but that, that is likely later in the day. Uh, and by that time, probably Jerome is out of the cupola because he doesn't write about signaling to Cemetery Hill. Uh, let's move on to the next slide. We'll see, uh, see from the cupola. This is a great image from the cupola. You could communicate with Cemetery Hill. You can see it um, very clearly. East Cemetery Hill is where the, uh, where the arrow is pointing to. Next slide. Uh, this is the communication that um, Aaron Jerome carries to Oliver Howard, which he writes about over a division of rebels is making a flank movement on our right. The line extends over a mile and is advancing skirmish of nothing but cavalry to close them. Now, you're all probably wondering, yeah, why July 2nd? It's an error. It's, <laughs> it, 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 it's a pretty egregious error. Um, there probably was no date on it at the time. That's why the date is bracketed, uh, but it's all but certain. And I'll, we'll sh I'll show you the, the page in a second um, that this was really meant on July 1st. There's no reason for Jerome to communicate directly with Howard on July 2nd. Means on the field. Next slide. Is that from the OR? Yes, that's from the OR. Uh, here's Pennsylvania College, uh, today Gettysburg College. Like I said earlier, it is used as an observation, signal observation post on July 1st, probably no communication. Michael Jacobs, again, we talked about him. He is the uh, professor of mathematics at Gettysburg College, Pennsylvania College, and keeps the weather. Uh, allegedly, he shows a team, the question is whether or not it was actually him. Some writings say uh, an officer of the college Others say it was Jacobs himself who bring signal officers up to the cupola of Pennsylvania Hall uh, to observe the, the land on July 1st. Who those officers were, how much time they spent up there is not known. But given that it, it, it likely, if it was anybody, it might have been some of the signal officers with uh, Reynolds Corps, because we know where Jerome is. Jerome is very clear about his, his whereabouts. Um, so it had to be the first corps and the 11th corps establishing their own <clears throat> signal station on Cemetery Hill. Okay. All right, so let's fast forward here to July 2nd. Uh, and we're gonna pick up the story with uh, Lemuel Norton, who is the chief signal officer of the army first corps. Uh, and his writings really stress the importance that Meade is placing on the signal corps during the battle. Norton says, on July 2nd, I reported at an early hour at the point selected for headquarters of the Army, so the Leicester House, um, but found the signal officers who had been previously, previously assigned to the different corps already on the field, and that through their exertions and the general commanding uh, through their exertions, the general commanding had been placed in communication with nearly all the corps commanders. Before 11 a.m., every desirable point of observation was occupied by a signal officer and every and communication opened from General Meade's headquarters to that of every corps commander. So we can see, if we look on this map, 
all of the locations of the different signal core. Um, so number one is, of course, at Meade's headquarters. We have one on Cemetery Hill, one on East Cemetery Hill, one back towards uh, Powers Hill, and then down Cemetery Ridge and towards the Round Tops. Uh, and with this, you're covering a lot of the best places to observe, East Cemetery Hill, East Cemetery Hill, and Little Round Top. Now, this is where everybody knows about the signal core, the role that they play um, on July 2nd on Little Round Top. So we're gonna go to the next slide. Um, so down here, the, the uh, red circle is Little Round Top, signal station on Little Round Top. The blue circle is the spot at which uh, Longstreet's core can be seen from the Little Round Top signal station. So Longstreet is moving two divisions, Hood and McClaws, down to the southern end of the battlefield uh, to attack up towards the Emmitsburg Road as he's marching this way far march around to try to stay out of view. Uh, he crosses a little rise on Black Horse Tavern Road and as you, and I've seen it, I drive it, my in-laws live, way I get to my in-laws house when I wanna go there. Um, you come up over this little rise and you can see a little round top. And this is after, you know, 160 years almost of being, being uh, built up. Uh, so it's gonna force McClaws and Hood to counter march around to try to stay out and is gonna delay, stay out of view and is gonna of course delay uh, the uh, the attack. Let's move on to the next slide. Um, now, who is sending? Who is up there on Little Round Top? Aaron Jerome. The rebels are in force and our skirmishers give way. One mile west of Round Top Signal Station. The woods are full of them. This is later on. Am I running out of time? No, you're fine. Okay, good. Um, but there are other signal officers. Uh, Babcock Hall. This is where you see uh, that that actual July, the July first message that was snuck in there on July second. Xed it out. Um, but all of these communications starting at 11:55 a.m., 12:35, uh, 1:30, 2:10, uh, all about from the little round top, the round top signal station reporting to headquarters what's going on, what they are seeing. Uh, and this is, of course, what's going to dispatch Governor Warren to observe. Uh, and, and, you know, by that time, they're going to find Dan Sickles has moved out and all of it, all of the, uh, the July 2nd. So uh, these are the communications that are saving the right flank, the left flank of the Union law. Um, and of course, we have uh, the signal, the tablet that's up there on Little Round Top recognizing uh, what's going on there and how they saved uh, the, the left flank. I also put the plaque on Pennsylvania College on um, to, to show how they acknowledge that it was used as a signal station. Let's go back to slides because I do want to talk about July. Uh, another one. There we go. I want to talk about July 3rd. So July 3rd, signal stations are still in place. Probably in this exact, almost in this exact formation. In fact, Norton says the same positions were occupied and the reports and movements unfailingly sent to the commanding general. Now, this is all going to get thrown into disarray about one o'clock in the afternoon on July 3rd because of the cannonade. And there are two signal stations, specifically Meade's headquarters and Oliver Howard's that become, according to Norton, uh, were rendered un inoperative for a couple of hours. Uh, that might be the most understatement of understatements about Pickett's charge and the cannonade. Um, but both were again actively employed as soon as the tremendous fire moderated sufficiently to permit of messages being read and transmitted with accuracy. 
Now, Meade is going to move his headquarters on July 3rd because it's untenable. He's actually going to head back to Powell's Hill. And one of the reasons that he chooses that spot is because there already is a signal station established. So even if he is going to move away from his headquarters, he will still be able to remain in communication with all parts of the Army because of the established signal station at Powers Hill. Um, Norton also says the station on Round Top continued to report through the day discoveries in regards to the enemy position on July 3rd. So throughout the battle, beyond the little Round Top episode that we, we know about, signal stations are being used to transmit information back and forth and are being used in their role as observation. So the evening of July 3rd, after the failure of Pickett's Pettigrew Trimble assault, Lee is gonna pull his army back to Seminary Ridge. It's gonna pull Early's men back, it's gonna pull Hood's guys back, oh, Hood's not commanding anymore, but back from uh, the base of Little Round Top. And as they start to pull back, the Union Army starts to kind of move into the town uh, and move a little bit more towards the Confederate lines. And they're actually gonna establish signal stations within town and at the college to keep an eye on what the Confederates are doing. So on July 4th, you see a signal station that's established at the courthouse in downtown Gettysburg and another signal station on the top of Pennsylvania Hall, Gettysburg College. <laughs> so they can kind of see, because Meade needs to know, we could have a whole discussion about why Meade doesn't follow up. Part of that is he doesn't know what Lee is doing. He has no idea what Lee is doing until July 7th. Um, but he is sending his signal officers into town on July 4th, into those stations of observation to try to figure out what, what Lee's next move is uh, going to be. Uh, and as Lee pulls back down the Hagerstown Pike with his army, that are going on the Chambersburg Pike, but as he pulls down the Hagerstown Pike, Six Corps is going to be following closely behind, and they're going to have signal officers with them to transmit information back to me uh, on the battlefield so he can decide what his next move is going to be. And when I say he doesn't know until July 7th what Lee is doing, he doesn't know if Lee is retreating to Virginia or if Lee is going to make a stand in the mountains. doesn't know that until July 7th. And Meade can't move until he knows for sure what's going on. So Signal Corps is playing an important role and will continue to do so throughout the retreat. All right, let's, well, okay, so we stopped. Let's go back. So we talked about memory, uh, how the Signal Corps is remembered today on the battlefield with two plaques, uh, one more prominent than the other, I would argue. Uh, this plaque is right under uh, the Governor Warren statue on the top of Little Round Top. This is on the front of Pennsylvania Hall at Gettysburg College. Not as many people um, probably see that one, but I, it, they certainly deserve, I would argue, uh, recognition, maybe even a little bit more recognition than just these two plaques because they are playing an important role. And Meade, Buford, others are placing a very high value on the actions of these men, these Signal Corps men, uh, both as observers and uh, communicators. So let's go to the, the final slide, uh, the education that we do. Um, so I said earlier that, you know, one of the reasons that I got so into this is because this was the first program that I I built, we had a Signal Corps flag made. Uh, we had little ones made too. So we have students come in and uh, we teach them how to communicate. We, we hand out the code and we show them you know, the movements and then we say pair up and 
go and, and learn how to communicate with each other. And I did have a teacher that jokingly admonished me that the students, instead of sending texts or notes to each other, that we were there, he, she was going to see them in, in class um, communicate. So as we, as we close up, I just want to, uh, next slide, please, uh, put in, and I'm going to happily answer any questions that you might have, but put in another uh, short plug for our Seminary Ridge Museum. Uh, this is only one of the many, many stories that we tell within the walls of our building. Uh, we are a 501c3 nonprofit, so we rely on uh, admissions tickets, donations, memberships uh, to keep the doors open, keep the lights on, and keep doing programs like the Signal Corps program. Um, and I have information over here about all of that. If you find yourself in Gettysburg the last Friday of July or August, we have our special sunset at the seminary walking tours. And we have uh, the seminary in the battle is in July, uh, which looks at sort of the seminary and the people who live there in the crosshairs of battle. And then in August, we're doing a brand new tour called Architecture on Seminary Ridge. The seminary to its credit, I guess, uh, has never knocked down a building in its 120 year history. Um, so you have a really interesting collection of different architectures uh, and tell a story about uh, changes over time. In the fall, we have a bus tour that we are working on right now. We have a bus tour every fall, but we haven't done it in the last three years. And um, it may or may not be, I'm gonna tell you, uh, following in the footsteps of Buford and Reynolds on the 130th of July. Yeah. Um, and then finally, the last event that we have planned for this year uh, is when we started last year um, on November 2nd and 3rd, uh, which is a Tuesday and Wednesday, um, there, there's an organization in Gettysburg called the Adams County Community Foundation. And they hold a big day of giving every year uh, for nonprofits in the community. And last year we decided uh, in honor and to support this uh, to do a program called 24 Hours on the Ridge in which we kept the museum open for 24 hours, uh, including a special screening of the movie Gettysburg from midnight to 4 a.m. Six people stayed. I didn't. I went to sleep. <laughs> um, but uh, we're going to do that again this year. And I think we're going to show Lincoln this year. Midnight, the midnight movie. So uh, thank you for having me.